Paul and myself will be leading this worship service this morning. Uh, just a couple quick reminders. If you're a visitor, please sign our guest book back in the narthex. Other than that, just remember that next Sunday on the 26th will be our dedication of our windows. And other than that, I believe that's it. Pastor should be back on Tuesday. So, without further ado, uh, opening hymn will be 549. We'll stand on the last verse.
sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestow on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this work, good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue at the top of page 52 with the Kyrie. In uh, peace, let us pray to the Lord. From the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord.
verses 1 through 9, and it's printed on the back of your worship folder. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to, the re to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat is in their vessels, who say, Keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into, the, into their bosom both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills, I will measure into their bosom payment for their former deeds. Thus says the Lord, As the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, Do not destroy it, for there is blessing in it. So I will do for my servants' sake, and not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it, and my servants shall dwell there. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is found in Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through chapter 4, verse 4, and it's printed on the back of your worship folder. We'll read it together, and once we read it, we will stand and, uh, for the Alleluia verse. We read together. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith. So then they until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all in one, Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean that heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the day set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the Alleluia verse. For a long time he had worn no clothes and had not lived in a house, 
but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of Gesserasenus asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned, and the man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
The text for this sermon this morning is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of our of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. My father first spoke the words of this sermon on June 21st in 1964 to the members of, Good, of Faith Lutheran Church up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. A few months ago, there were those people who made obvious reference to the first Good Friday earthquake as the city of Anchorage, Kodiak, and Valdez, Alaska were all but wiped out of existence by, the, by a tremendous earth tremor. The shaking, the stretching, the breaking, rolling, shifting of the earth's crust in Alaska is much more closely connected with our epistle tests of this morning. Our text deals with our life in the here and now. It notes that many sufferings and shocks. It compares the experience of today with the moments of new birth. The labor pains are increasing in intensity and frequency. All creation looks forward to the expected moment. The Alaskan earthquake is an example of the way in which nature itself yearns for that promised moment. What about you? Do you, as you experience the changes from sorrow to joy, from pain to happiness, and back again to sorrow and pain, do you live through them with the sense of urgent expectancy that nature indicates? So often it appears that we do not at all look forward for that moment of the glorious birth of a new world. Our text makes the point that we are now, together with all creation, in a waiting period. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. What we are waiting for is the appearance, the revelation of the sons of God, now that sounds like a puzzle because we have so often been told that we are, are already sons of God now. But St. John put his finger on the important truth involved when he wrote this. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. Obviously, that has to mean that some fact, some part, some experience of being a child of God is still being reserved for us in the future. This is what we are waiting for. With Paul, we are waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are looking forward to that time when God will balance the accounts, when, as Paul said, God will grant to you who are troubled rest. St. Peter urged Christians to gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is when his glory shall be revealed. Ye may be glad with exceeding, with exceeding joy. As we begin to combine these statements of the inspired men of God, the picture of that final revelation starts coming into sharper focus. Much is still hidden from us, but we do know that Christ's coming will be visible it will be marked by his great and divine glory. It will, it will mark the end of suffering and sorrow. It will be a time of liberation. Liberation and freedom, that implies that slavery 
is a condition of our present life. How true. For the created creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, sub subject to vanity, a slave to pride. In the middle of that word sin is that great immense I, that constant push that I want more than I have, or than others have, that I must experience more joy, that I should receive more honor, that I should be asked my, for my opinions, that I should be granted more promotions. Even we adult people are no different than the little baby girl or boy who throws a temper tantrum because he is supposed to sit quietly and doesn't want to. Or the child that demands that he have the biggest cookie or piece of candy. It is that sin which has made us slaves to evil, to suffering, to sorrow, and to slavery. As St. Paul does, we could also call this life the groaning period. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. The period of waiting is not easy. It is full of groaning. God told us to enter the kingdom of God, we must pass through many hardships. St. Paul reminds the Christians in Philippi, you have been granted the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but also suffering for him. Timothy was urged, as we heard last Sunday, to bear hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Oh, how long this period has lasted. The world has waited with longing hope for the Savior to come as promised. He came, but even in his coming, in his entering the valley of the shadow of death, so that we might have life, even he too groaned. He suffered, he died that we might live. So together with all creation, we groan as we await the full enjoyment of his revelation as King of all kings. It is this it is as if we Christians in creation are experiencing a long, long suffering of birth pains. There are changes, changing seasons in life that may bring temporary relief from the trials of life. There may be moments of temporary rest, but over and over again come the tribulations and the afflictions which continue, make, continue to make this life a period of labor and groaning, of travail and tiredness. But there is something we can trust. God subjected creation and also us to this life with hope. St. Paul expressed this certain hope as he wrote to Timothy. If we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Yet, if we are faithless, he will always remain faithful. He cannot deny his own nature. In our own lives, we would gain much hope, much strength, if we had the trust to enable to say, This means tremendous joy to you, I know, even though at present you are temporarily harassed by all kinds of trials and temptations. This is no accident. It happens to prove your faith which infinitely is more valuable than gold. And gold, as you know, even though it is ultimately perishable, must be purified by fire. This proving of your faith is planned to bring you praise and honor and glory in the day when Jesus Christ himself reveals himself. There are those impatient, self-centered, conceited persons who think that they know more than God that they could plan the existence of creation, direct its development, and the events of our lives in a much wiser and beneficial way than God. But they are the very ones who remain in the spiritual slavery of sin and eventual death. The Christian is one who repeats with Paul, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which is to be revealed in us. The whole point is that this period of waiting and period of groaning 
is merely the introduction and entrance to the period of eternal rejoicing. It is important for us to recognize the purpose of these bitter experiences of life. God chastens us so to that we may be more chaste and clean. He purges us that we may be more pure. He disciplines us that we may be and remain his disciples. And when that chastening, that purging, and that disciplining is done, when it has performed its purpose, then suffering turns to, into splendor. Hope turns to actual revelation. Chain, shame changes into glory. Death becomes life. I say that all this is worth waiting for, and it is worth all of the groaning that is wrung from us. There is one thing that remains to bother us. We apparently do not hear very much groaning from the so-called Christians today. We hear a lot about having more rain, less wind and heat, about higher pay scales and shorter work weeks, about newer and shinier and more powerful cars, about new eye makeup and swimsuits. In fact, it, it all sounds like a pretty fair life. A life which we aren't at all too eager to give up. And yet God, who just doesn't make any mistakes, says that this life on earth, in these United States, here in South Dakota, will be a life in which the Christian, together with creation, will do a great deal of groaning. They will plead intensely for an end to this world and hope fervently for the life and the world to come. Will it not be your prayer? Does not the word, the promise of God in Jesus Christ also lead you to pray? Even so, Lord Jesus, come. May the peace of the Lord, which passes all human understanding, Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
the words, Lord, and I will be any petition with the words, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with hear our prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God, in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. O King of kings, and Lord of lords, you call out every nation of every seeking repentance and justice, even as they rebel against your will. Work repentance in all civil leaders. Use them to defend the weak and to punish the guilty that the church may have free course to preach the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, your Son sent the man formerly possessed by demons to declare how much God had done for him. May your church also, rescued from the snares of the devil, proclaim how much Jesus has done for us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, from whom all fatherhood is named, we give you thanks for earthly fathers. Give them confidence in their station and zeal for their task to care for their families faithfully. Make them examples to their children of godly life and love of your word. Bless their work of bringing up children in the fear and instruction of the Lord and give them the comfort, your absolution over all their shortcomings. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have established governments and institutions for good order and our well-being. Guide and grant wisdom to the leaders and citizens. Give peace, security, and good laws to our own country, our cities, and our communities. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Lord, your Son, Jesus, had pity on the man afflicted with an abundance of demons. Have mercy now on the afflictions that beset all for whom we pray. Give them healing, strength, and an increase of faith. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Merciful God, Isaiah spoke of a new wine full of blessing that will not be destroyed. Grant us faithfully to eat and drink the Lord's own body and blood given in the fellowship of the altar. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Most gracious God, we give thanks for the joy and blessings that you have granted Brian Benjamin and Rebecca Penson. Assist them always with your grace, that with true fidelity and steadfast love that they ever honor and keep their promises. Grow in love for you and for each other, and come at last to the eternal joys that you have promised. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Finally, dear Father, you know the condition of our souls that we frequently wander into sins, vice, and danger. Hear our prayers for the sake of Christ. You defeated legions of demons so that we might receive adoption of sons. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us the our Father, And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.